And so I come to this, so the LGBT community uh, is, it, it's pervasive, body image conflict is pervasive in the LGBT community, whether it's around sexual orientation, as people try to you know, find their relationships and thinking they have to be a certain way in order to attract, attract other people. Um, it comes across in uh, gender affirmation, whether it's uh, transgender uh, folks wanting to affirm their gender identity in a body that is not is not what they are. Um, that that is a big thing in the LGBT community as well. And then also issues of um, body image that a lot of non-LGBT people um, uh, deal with. It also exists in the LGBT community. So just glad to be here with Michelle for Absolutely. bringing us together. Thank you all. Um, so. As, as you look around, we have a pretty large variety in um, types of artwork, the different images shown, the different materials, um, the makers, um, the time period they were made, the culture that they come from. Uh, so, and I think Michelle really worked hard to show the human body in a range of motion and emotion and thinking about this topic in a lot of different respects and how we could think about um, how we view our own body, bodies that feel um, hostile towards themselves and then more homogeneous, those that are moving, in, whether in work or play. And um, so what I thought we could start with is, is there a specific object um, that speaks to you and why? And then it can be personal or connected to some of the skills that you did most work in. Wanted to kind of bring it to the object first and then we can kind of go from there. Why? So Penny's work, which is right over here, and then up here the sitting and standing study number 33, which is Miri, Miri, is that how you pronounce it? Um, those are the two that connected with me in the work that I do, because I see these as um, more androgynous depictions, um, and I think that's a lot of what, uh, what, what I see in our transgender students and transgender employees at ISA is this this forming up of um, policies, procedures, healthcare, whatever it is, mental health care, whatever it is they're receiving from the campus um, can come out. And so in these two, very much the, not, not lack of emotion, but kind of the dimming of emotion is what I think a lot of people put forward when there's all this turmoil inside of the body image. And they're also pretty androgynous, and so um, it always reminds me about how gender is something that the person knows about themselves, not that we know about them. And so I love depictions of androgyny because um, then, you know, it gives us that dissonance of, is that a man or is that a woman? Does it matter? It doesn't really matter because the message behind the art is, is the message. So I, I was drawn to those. And then the farmer, because that's my grandpa. That's totally, <laughs> and that guy had a buzz cut down there. <laughs> and so as an Iowa, as an Iowa woman, that, that Yeah, um, those um, two pieces that you um, talked about, thinking um, that is the, I think the piece that drew me to those pieces out of the thousands of options of um, art pieces in the permanent collection was the, um, the reality that our body and the manipulation of our body is so often used as a way to communicate externally about who we think we're supposed to be, or how we're supposed to show up. And I greatly appreciated um, the vulnerability of, of those two pieces in really showing that the questioning and the quiet and what happens when we're just us and not putting on the mask for the, the world and, um, and how much body hostility there is when our shell doesn't align with how we feel. And whether that's from a gender place or from a, just like accepting who we are supposed to allow ourselves to be versus who we're told to be. For me, it's the sculpture up front here that really spoke to me. And partly because of the division, the body negativity, and then you would think, well, what's the opposite of a 
body negativity, body positivity, right? But I don't really use that word anymore because I don't think it's, it puts a lot of pressure on people and it's so black and white. And so I like to use the words um, body respect, which all bodies, no matter what gender, what color, what size, all deserve to eat and all deserve to have their basic needs met. And so then recently I came to the conclusion that I like body liberation even better because um, I'm really working on just not in myself because even though I've been immersed in all of this, you know, for years, you, we still live in the same world as everybody else and still get those ideals that get stuck in our head. And so I'm pulling away the self-worth piece from that. So I may not, or somebody may not like what they look like in the mirror, and they may never like it, but they can separate that self-worth piece from it and still feel like, you know what, it doesn't matter if I don't particularly like how I look, but I'm a good person. And so that's what I've been focusing on recently. Um, for me, I was really drawn to the pictures of dance, uh, probably for obvious reasons, but group fitness, it's very social um, and just really moving in, in a natural way that feels good to you is something that we really focus on, like really stepping away. When you're in that body hostility, it's exercise becomes punishment, right? Like you're forcing yourself to do it, you're punishing yourself because you've done something that you feel like this will make up for to exercise. And when I looked at those paintings, I just felt like, it just seems like these people are dancing and moving in this natural way that just feels good for them. Like they were inspired in the moment to just move their body versus like, it's five o'clock and this is my workout time and this is what I have to do. And that's what I feel like what we are trying to do with working with people who are struggling in this place is getting to that place of, I'm gonna go for a walk because it, it sounds, because it feels good. Like, or I'm gonna go to a dance class because I enjoy dance and so, those ones I was really drawn to, but also this, this painting called The Yarn, and I even in myself can't quite figure out exactly what it is that draws me to it, but it's almost that, like the body's so abnormal in this painting that it, it, it just draws me to it in that, like, well, there's no certain way that you have to look, like it, it just speaks to me in that, you know, one leg's this side, the other leg's that side, and this arm, and so something about that one really just drew me to it also, just in that body acceptance of, Everybody's body is going to look different, and that's okay. Well, no, I just, um, it, um, it's affirming to me that uh, each of you in your professional lenses is seeing the pieces and the reasons why I was drawn to those pieces as I was trying to be really representative of what are all the pieces that play a part in our body image. And, and functionality of what can my body do for me is a, a significant piece of that. And um, that joyful movement and having bodies that are in motion, we're, we're designed to move. We were supposed to move. And um, moving through the fun of it versus the obligation of it is a huge shift in paradigm for us to get to, um, you know, and, and this, that it doesn't have to be for a certain amount of time or a certain intensity or follow some rubric um, is such an important message for us to embrace and model for, for students, for younger children, for, you know, everybody. You just, you know, we are aging and changing as well. And so it just feels like this constant quest of what is joyful movement is, is always going to be shifting and changing. Um, yeah. It's really interesting just to watch children. I was walking past a neighborhood daycare and these children were probably two, three years old. And just to watch them, I actually had tears in my eyes. I listened to a podcast that's all about health at every size and inclusivity and it just really gets me thinking and then I came across these kids that are moving their arms and they're just jumping around and they were just having so much fun just moving and I was just like, when does that go away? Yeah. I mean, because it's, and I know when it goes away, when people start telling them, well, you need to be doing this and that and the messages that they receive and that's just, that's hard. 
Thank you all. Um, so I, I wanted to turn now and think about um, makers as well as kind of images. So um, I'm from an art history background, so I guess this is maybe this question is coming from my skewed <laughs> perspective of that. But I, you know, we see examples throughout um, time and of men representing women's bodies. And one of the, having these two next to each other at the start, these are both male artists who are um, representing who I can, I guess I read these as women, mm -hmm. <laughs> both. Um, but we also included, um, just behind here, an uh, image made by a woman artist representing a man in a very kind of um, intimate sort of vulnerable way. And I think that was important for us to have both of those uh, perspectives shown. But I want to ask, how can an artist and their gender uh, change or affect the way we can understand or interpret this image? Or you know, how, mu how much does that matter in the way that we look at these objects, how much we know about that art? Maybe that's a large question. <laughs> Well, I mean, and with, with Neri's painting, it says it's a woman. I mean, in the yeah. description, right? So at some point, the, the artist said that, mm -hmm. that. That's what it is. Um, but for, I guess I wasn't. Well, I have, I have strong feelings about that particular painting. <laughs> but, you know, I, yeah, in, in the way that he, you know, because he, he does, um, he had a single model that he worked with for a long time, about 30 years. Um, and he was very interested in showing different bodies in different ways, and I think in movements and how they look. But to me, it's very hard for me to separate that quest, right, for, for looking at the body without reading it as here's this man constantly showing naked women in kind of vulnerable, like, these positions without a face and without kind of this recognizable shape. And I, so that's hard. I, I, that's hard for me <laughs> to kind of reconcile those two things. And so I suppose that's where my question is sort of coming from. Is, you know, how do you, how can we think about that? And what does that mean? And you know, not to say, oh, well, men can't make images of women, or that, you know, like not to restrict, but like how can that dictate how we can think about um, our objects? Well, I think that from a psychological standpoint. Um, the faceless image is often how people in pain move about day-to-day -day life. That they are there in a body, however emotionally or from a cognitive place, maybe disconnected or maybe in a totally different space. That, um, you know, there's a, a commercial for depression medication and they're holding up like one um, of those it's a smiley face, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just covering their face. It's like, I'm here, and this is what I'm supposed to look like right now. And I do think that there is often this disconnect that um, um, a lack of being authentic or genuine. Like I'm just going through, and I'm just doing what I think you want me to do. And so I definitely feel like that is really represented often um, in art of I'm showing um, this person who has it all together or is a, in their best self. Um, and so um, there is that lens and also I think Often, as a society, we are viewed by, like, neck down. That it is about, in some ways, your physique and your sexual traits, and that who you are, or what you believe in, or your intellectual ability is not part of what's important in the equation. So it, it, I think from two spaces, for me, yeah, that really connects. I noticed, too, that people in larger bodies, when they're photographed, you often find that they're photographed in a negative light. It's just that their head is chopped off, it's just their body. But you don't really ever see that in people that have the mainstream body ideal or whatever you want, socially accepted, whatever you want to call it. If 
I think gender comes into play when the artist, if it's artist versus subject, that's what I'll call it. Mm -hmm. If the artist is trying to idealize something by depicting a subject in an ideal way, like the perfect, the perfect human form, like Hercules or whatever, mm -hmm. that can be harmful, and that's where I would think that gender, like a man depicting that, why does anybody depicting that, that would be harmful? Um, but for me, it's, it rings differently if it's, if it's a, a male mm -hmm. depicting the ultimate female form mm -hmm. and then trying to pass that off as some ideal it's something we should all aspire to. Yeah. Um, but then, I don't even know if I'm getting at your question, because it's a very good question, but for female oh, artists, mm -hmm. When, if you're making a political statement, sometimes that's about downplaying a male form or a form mm -hmm. for the sake of pointing out the problems with it. And so in both situations, you're inaccurately, or you're doing something to character, or car caricaturize to make a point. Yeah. Um, but I guess the message behind it is harmful to me. Is that? Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. And I think, yeah, those are just things I think about. Because like, this one, like the Peterson, to me, like I think you could potentially read that as like, oh, this is like this very ideal looking um, woman's body, and she's very beautiful, she's slim, you know, she's like looking over her shoulder. But to somehow, to me, this reads as like far more like loving in a way, or like respectful than than Mary. Um, and maybe that's just my reading of those two together. Um, but I just think it's yeah. That we see this image, you know, and it's kind of this. I just suppose it's a museum problem <laughs> that exists for a long time. You see this, you know, huge amounts of male artists in museum collections, but yet the subject matter in large percentages can be female. <laughs> and it's something, you know, that can come up. And I think museums are making great strides and changing. And I think it's something we're very cognizant of. Cognizant of. And as a collection, we actually have a pretty, pretty large percentage of, of female identifying artists um, in that collection. But, you know, it's just something I think about, like, subject versus artist and how can like, gender work its way into that. And, and this isn't really art related, but in my field, Body Mass Index, which is not evidence based, by the way, and actually it was, you know, BMI to calculate how healthy your body is, was actually, um, it was based off of European men in the 1800s and was never supposed to be used to categorize people. He even said it, it's not supposed to be used to categorize people by their health, and yet that's exactly what was done. And it is 2020, and the medical profession, health profession still uses it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, this is sort of a continuation of this last question, but um, leading off of that, um, not necessarily in the specific um, idea of, of a different one gender representing another, but more generally, um, how do you feel like um, but that gender can play a role in body image conflict? And how do you see different people identifying in different genders? How do they face body image in conflict in different ways? And how does that kind of manifest, how can it manifest itself differently for different Well, you know, I mean, so for all the genders, for every gender, a person can identify it as. Um, so I'm going to go beyond that binary, yeah. because my brain goes there too. But um, for, I've been, th so I've been thinking, because I looked at your model, and um, when we talk about hostility to um, harmony, for trans folks, that often does not come, or it comes at a health price, whether it's mental health or physical health, because as you're trying to affirm your gender, or you're trying to wear certain things that make your body look the way you want it to look, or if you're lucky enough to be able to afford surgery, maybe you can get to that harmony. So I was really interested, maybe when we talk about your model, you can talk about where that happens for trans people, like where they might find that harmony when the conflict is there that what I know about my gender, other people can't tell I'm looking at me. And so that's, that's something I've been thinking 
the law. See, that's one of the reasons why I don't like the word body acceptance and also um, body positivity because that doesn't apply to everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the whole body liberation word really speaks to me. And, and it's not and just trans folks, right? No. I mean, it, it's, it can be people with health uh, oh, for sure. Health but, issues yeah. or just the way your body is born, right? Yeah. It's not, um, and that's actually something I've been talking with students about is um, the definition of health and what I tell them, I'll say, well, let's say I have MS, can I never be healthy then because I have a disease? And so trying to get challenge their thinking that health for each person can look very differently. And so I think on that spectrum of body image, it can be the same as far as like acceptance to liberation. Like even when we talk about movement, like a person who's bed bound, yeah. like that's how yeah. it's health for them. It's, right. it's just an interesting yeah. thing. I'm so excited to hear. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't happen today, then I'm going to talk to you about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope that you do. I think, I think for me, I think about, um, so uh, my background is in music ed. So you think about the different genres of music and that um, harmony in different genres sounds very different. Like the chords that come together um, can sound or be experienced in really, really unique, different ways. And so when I think about harmony, um, for me it is like this coming together in a moment. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you love the reflection that's coming back at you. It means that you feel that things came together for you in whatever way that makes sense, whether that's that you had, um, I don't know, you gave yourself permission to spend money on a, a, an outfit, or you gave yourself permission to go on a trip, because maybe you had always said, well, when I weigh X amount, or when I, I don't know, accomplish this thing, then I'm worth whatever. Um, but it's, it is it's is that value of self, um, and allowing joy. Like noticing the music around you, kind of concept, um, and I, I do just think it's really important. Like, it's not a long way up, right? Like in our life, we're gonna move back and forth on our body quest because we age, or you have surgery and you suddenly can't do. You're not an able body, or like something happens and. You're like, oh, I guess I gotta figure out a different way to do that thing I love. You know, maybe I'm gonna have to buy a tricycle instead of a bike or a recumbent. Or, so, yeah, I mean, it just, it, it, it is a journey. It is not, we're never like, check, check, like, woohoo, well done, have a great. <laughs> so, that's <laughs> one of the reasons, too, that, because, um, you know, we do a lot of eating disorder work. I don't like the term full recovery at all because I think it puts a lot of pressure on people. I don't think I've ever said this out loud before to a group, but it puts a lot of pressure on people. And full recovery can look completely different in one person from the other. And so um, I myself struggled in the past with an eating disorder, and that just always bothered me. I'm like, I don't even know what full recovery is. I always questioned it until I made my own definition for it. And so I have the title of my book, I just don't have the chapters, but it's going to be <laughs> The Purgatory of um, Full Recovery. Oh. <laughs> I have a lot of those book titles in my head. <laughs> I actually have some totes. Um, I have three different totes. <laughs> so what is that? I'm like, don't look at that. That's book number two. <laughs> Students that I worked with that were former athletes that like 
their body just goes away because in their adolescence they were still children. You know, they were, they were playing sports and things like that. And so that struggle then for, for males in that um, realm of like, oh, I've got to like be big, the, you know, like just that perception for males and, and that struggle for them um, is just something I think that we sometimes don't think about or recognize right away because just the, the obvious image is, is um, someone who identifies as a female is struggling with, a, with body image issues or um, eating disorders. Recognizing that too, there's a lot of pressure for males in our society also, just in a very different way. Yeah, and um, right now, um, um, adolescents who identify as male in that age range of 10 to 13 is the um, demographic that eating disorder percentages are increasing faster than any other demographic, other than our trans identified individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, that it, it is a huge misstep for our medical field. Mm -hmm. Physicians and pediatricians are not asking, it's not on their radar. Um, and as um, families are not on the lookout for it in their um, you know. I feel like it's not even on their radar for somebody that looks like they have a eating disorder. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, there's not near enough education with our providers. I, it's one of those things where I don't think they know enough about it, so they just, it gets ignored. It's not, not every provider, but there's a lot. Thank you. Uh, let's see, so we did start to talk about the model, so I don't know if you've all had a chance to see it. So Michelle created a, a model that move, that shows movement from a household place of uh, looking at your own body to uh, more a homemade place. So, um, what are some of the ways that in your professional field that you can see um, contributing to a change, maybe in, in either direction, or movement across that model, um, in how, how we see how we see ourselves, how individuals see themselves? There are a lot of examples, but one probably that everybody knows about is the Supreme Court's ruling on Title VII. So that guarantees work. Um, it, it protects folks from uh, work harassment or um, getting fired based on their sex, which also includes their gender, which was a big, that's a big thing for um, trans that, or for trans, the trans community is that now Title VII protects that community. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I see things like that, where it's laws or policies or governance things that allow rights to, that allow for the rights that everybody should have in a very public way. Um, but that's just the first thing that came to my mind. That's probably, that's probably nowhere near what your question was asking. But I think when it's those fundamental structural yeah, legal things important. that we can look to and say, hey, guess what? Now, no matter what state you live in, you can now be who you are. And I think fundamentally, when a person realizes that they can live their full self in society, that contributes to a positive body image or a, a more harmonious you know, body image. No, that makes sense to me. And I think some of the things that Michelle's included talk, you know, can speak to specifically you know, cultural um, pressures of how we're meant to look. And you know, I think that by, you know, that makes sense to me that we think about regulations that would say, no, this is, this is not the thing. This protects anybody, but that would be a contributing factor to like, thinking about an individual scale or I, I think that any time that we as an individual can um, do our own exploration of where we come from, in context of cultural pieces, in context of privilege, and then the impact. So, um, you know, here in the Midwest, in the bread basket of um, the country, um, our racism and insecurity 
are something that I think in the last, let's say, five years have been much more at the forefront of awareness. And that prior to that, I feel like there was a lot of judgment or um, shaming for individuals who, who lacked food. And you know, we think from a nutrition model, what types of food does the um, lower socioeconomic community have access to? Processed, mm -hmm. um, high sodium, um, you know, less nutritional density. Um, you just have to walk into the grocery store and look at the price of your fresh vegetables versus a can that has syrup, right? Mm -hmm. It's very evident. And that all of that plays a part in our body and how we use food and how it, it gets cooked and prepared and the role of the food. Like what purpose is this nutrition serving for me? What kind of emotional hole am, am I using that food for? Um, so I think there's just so many pieces that play a part in where am I at on that continuum? Um, what is my family's expectation? Like does my body match my family's bodies um, or not? And um, in a much bigger kind of go, like looking is like what is what is my cultural relationship with food? Is that a joyous piece or, or not? And there's so many messages around food. It's such a complicated uh, you know, piece. If we were talking about any other kind of um, addiction, the equivalent with food, it would be to say, like if we're talking about alcohol versus food, the equivalent would be to say to an alcoholic, now, what I would like for you to do is I would like you to three times a day do one shot of the like what you know vodka, and three times a day I would like you to drink one beer, no more, no less. This is like the programmed thing, and expect them to do that consistently and only do that, not skip it because like you're supposed to do that. And we, we think about that and go, that's so wrong. Why would we do that? And yet, that is what we do with food. And we act like that's just supposed to be easy and like normal. And it is completely not. Um, so it's so complicated. And it's so individualized. Um, because you have to think about at what point do you become the um, what, at what point are you independent enough to steer your own choice? Mm -hmm. When do you get to prepare your own food or um, go to your own food bank, like to have the independence to access it or to learn how to prepare it in a different way or try new foods? Um, and that's so different depending on the culture, whether you know, you come from a Caucasian family, a Latino family, a, you know, like, the messages around independence. It's you know, so big and then there's so much judgment. Um, hey, uh, I, yeah, I think that the, I like to use the word continuum for describing the model because I think it is, you know, it's not like you're landed in one place all the time. So you did kind of end talking about culture, and that sort of leads me to the next question I have. Uh, so we did try and include different representations of bodies from different cultures, um, but also different time periods. Our earliest one is from ancient Rome, and went all the way up to contemporary. So uh, how can looking at representations from across different time periods and cultures help inform us about current cultural pressures in our own? Space that we experience. Okay, so I'm so glad that you picked the Sarah piece, and it, nobody knows what kind of word is she or do. She's over down. Okay. Yeah. You do not know a lot of history of this. I'm so glad you picked it because many people don't know, you know the, the story behind, behind her. 
exhibition, uh, her you know, abduction from Africa, right? Abduction from Africa put on exhibit in European countries um, around her uh, body, around her body, basically, and the kind of catastrophic ways in which people were <laughs> honoring her, which is weird. Um, so you have to that in depth before you go. Because, Michelle, when you picked that, and then the next picture you sent, or the next one was the um, Victorian era dress. Mm -hmm. um, the G. Yeah, it's with that one. Oh, yeah. it's with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, that was just, for me, I think everybody should keep those two things in mind because it really does depict kind of this, um, just this pressure. Well, first of all, demeaning a woman for her shape over the course of decades, and then having it become all the rage in fashion is exactly how our bodies are treated. All of those bodies are treated through like the idealizing and the demonizing and all of those ways in which we treat um, different body types. So I don't know what I was gonna say, what I was gonna say there. I just wanted to make sure everybody read that. <laughs> I wanted to make sure everybody reads about it if they don't already know that story. Yeah, in full transparency, I didn't know about that history until I had already chosen to show magazines, uh, like women's fashion magazines from the 1900s, and was doing a training where they talked specifically about that style of the dress and the history, the racist background of where did that look come from. And I was, again, as a person that has a lot of privilege, just rocketed to um, that, that space of knowing the need to know the history. Mm -hmm. Where did X phrase come from? Where did X style come from? And who are we stealing from mm -hmm. um, in that hairstyle, in that look? Um, and is it my right to partake in that or not. And um, so saddened um, by um, her story that hundreds, for hundreds of years she was still on display after being deceased. Mm -hmm. um, and um, those pieces around culture and how it plays a part in what is the look is, is um, fascinating because so much of that here uh, in America comes from marketing. Some mm -hmm. person in some conference room somewhere decides they don't want to sell X look. And then they hire people to represent that look. And then it is the new whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is amazing over history, um, and um, if people aren't familiar with the studies about body image that were done in Fiji, it's a fascinating um, background that Fiji was one of the last places that Western culture um, kind of was pervasive, so they didn't necessarily have access to TV at the same time, and movies, and um, the idealized cultural body at that point was more curvy, um, larger bodies that were, you know, able to work hard and um, as soon and and they, and archaeologists have done a study about um, body confidence, and then Western culture came in and the archaeologists went back and um, racist eating disorders were going through the rough the size and the expectation and the idealized totally changed. And so very much it's this like, what are we told the aristocrats or the people in power have um, in the same companies that sell Caucasian individuals, tanning creams and tanning gels, um, are also marketing in other countries, skin bleaching and you know, they're making money from every possible direction by convincing us we need to be different. So I think in this context, when you look historically, and just listening to Michelle for a couple minutes, you can see that 
there has never been any standard. Like it's always been in the moment or in the marketing or whatever it is. And there has, but there has always been co-opting of looks, taking cultural things and making it another culture's thing. Um, and for me, you need to read like white culture adopting other people's, or white people adopting other people's cultures for their own. Like that just replays all the time over the course of history. And so I think in this context with body image, it can be used to give us a break. You know, like give yourself a break about things. And maybe that's the wrong way to say it, Michelle. I mean, that's a, yeah. this is not my background. Yeah. But no, what you said is exactly what I was thinking. Like it's almost reassuring, right? Like that you can reject it because it changes all the time. It's like the flavor of the century, right? Yeah. And so, I don't, yeah, I agree exactly. And especially what Allison was saying about the BMI, not yeah. really ever being intended to use, be used the way it was, or the way it is. That's just, I think it, 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 it lends itself to, it's okay to be a little critical of the things that we see today. It's okay that when somebody says um, there is an idealized body type for, for us to say, no, I don't think there is. Maybe for you, <laughs> but not for, not, for, uh, not for the general or the larger society. So. Mm -hmm. And I love looking at the two images of Hercules in the map. I feel like it's like the perfect <laughs> example of showing, you know, the, the one from ancient Rome. I mean, it basically looks like a, a teenage boy. Mm -hmm. It was something I did in seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was two yeah. in the case right yeah. there. And then she's next to this one who is, you know, yeah. <laughs> some kind of fun, mm -hmm. like chiseled. Yeah. And it's so interesting to me that this is like the same person, you know, the same, you know, deity that they're talking about, the same figure, mythological figure, and how what was prized and what was thought to be really ideal is like wildly different. Um, yet, like the the Western one, I mean, that could be a modern to me, like that yeah. that kind of real Victorian image of, of, of that man has really stuck. Yeah, I don't know. I just think it's really fascinating to look at both of those. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, well, I've been, as you've been having this discussion, I'm thinking about a famous person that I saw on television last night who I'm pretty confident in had plastic surgery. And I'm thinking, what is there about what we're feeding into our culture that we feel we are so compelled to be young, to be youthful? And for some folks, that ends up as a total mess on their face and body. Mm -hmm. But what is it about us that that we feel that demand, that push, that obligation, that striving to be what we are not? Um, and that's my question, I guess. What is, what is there about us? It's, it's capitalism. It's keeping up with the Joneses. It's, it's, the, like, it's the tenets that our country is built on around. I mean, it's capitalism, I think, feeds wanting to keep up, because you have to in a capitalist society, you have to keep up or you get left behind. And then that feeds into doing as well as other people. But, uh, and I think it's about, I think it's about who gets to have voice. So this concept of power around um, youth and the lack of respect for our aging and if, um, if I look younger, maybe I'll get to work longer, or um, I will feel worthy of this or that. Um, and what's fascinating to me is that uh, for many years, one of the most popular gifts for 16-year-olds on both coasts has been plastic surgery. The, um, parents are gifting plastic surgery to their 16-year-old to have things done when their bodies aren't even through puberty. They're not even, they haven't even done whatever their body is going to do. And this permanent alteration, oftentimes, it takes a body and shifts it from, you know, so like people who have any kind of breast implant no longer have sensation in their chest. So it takes literally from objects that maybe should be pleasurable or about self and makes them objects that are for someone else's visual 
preference or pleasure. And so we, you know, it's this disconnect um, and this idea that we should be stagnant, that our bodies, like we should, as, as if once I reach this place, I should stay this size, this weight, this. It seems to be like age 25 of the pre pregnancy. Because how many times have you heard people say, I need to get back to my pre pregnancy weight? Mm -hmm. And it's like, how? Why? <laughs> yes. But mm -hmm. when it comes down to it, why people want to look a certain way is because they feel like they're not going to be accepted otherwise. I mean, I think that's the core to it. They want to be loved, they want to be accepted, they want to fit in. And, and body stigma and shaming is pervasive. It is um, socially acceptable um, in ways that other types of discrimination are not. Uh, all the way down from if you walk into lecture halls across this campus, that the um, alternative to having a seat large enough for a student would be to have a little desk in the front of the room in a huge lecture hall. Mm -hmm. um, like, oh, that one there is for you. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it, is, it is pervasive and um, taught mm -hmm. in the same way other discrimination is taught. Um, and you really can't blame the person because because um, I'm a very huge advocate and talk against weight stigma, but yeah, that's really easy for me to say I've never been in a large body, right? And I completely own that. I haven't been. This is my body. But I just know that it's wrong to stigmatize somebody because of their body. And I, it's, I just, I don't know. It's, it doesn't matter what body you're in. People are always going to say, what do you know about it? I mean, I don't know, but I can sit with somebody and listen to their pain. And you can't blame them for wanting to have a smaller body or to have a younger looking face because it's just been ingrained in us. And so I feel like we need compassion for people that choose to have plastic surgery or choose to have weight loss surgery or whatever it is. Because everyone walks a different path. Mm -hmm. I also think the media is just constantly telling us that you're going to be happier when, oh, yes. right? You're going to be happier when you get that plastic surgery. You're going to be happier when you lose the weight. And so it's also this like constant search for happiness almost. And like, I, I don't know how that person might feel now, but I'm assuming that they might have done that and still not have found what they're looking for, right? And it's like this constant search of looking for something and just not getting it, you know, in that way that you're looking for. So, mm -hmm. We all probably feel a little bit sad. I, I for sure can relate. So. Yeah, I, I, I love the discussion here. And uh, for me, it's like, oh man, we're, or you have talked for quite a while. It's really exciting to hear um, all of you talk about these different things. I wanted to just, um, in our last uh, few minutes here, um, give you a chance to uh, let our audience know about uh, campus resources that are available that lead to this subject. Um, and then you have a last talk that you want to So, in regard to um, body image services, um, we quite a bit available. Um, for outreach, um, um, the wellness department, we have peer educators um, that are trained um, to do some um, presentations on um, joyful eating, mindful eating. Um, we, as a university, have two dietitians through wellness, one that's specific um, for students who live in campus housing and one for students that live off campus and um, students um, can contact them. And they've developed some really great modules um, over this past summer. There are some educational models about the joy of eating and uh, addressing some just basic education pieces. And then students can also set up um, individual appointments with them to kind of talk through their own goals. Um, across campus, we're very fortunate that there are multiple of us that are health for everybody um, trained facilitators. Um, so we can be having conversations that include um, health at every size and weight neutral um, modalities. Um, Ashley mentioned earlier um, the eating disorder nutrition team. And students can, 
kind of come into that team from one of any of the services, which I love. Um, so um, the health center, um, faculty, or uh, staff, are great at doing physicals that will help um, get a baseline, nutrition, and like, is there underlying physiological concerns going on that need to be addressed, and how, do, how are we helping medically? Um, students can come in through rec services. Um, maybe they self-identify um, with, I'm really struggling with um, compulsive exercise, and um, um, their staff, actually one of, that really helps students maybe shift from aerobic to maybe more mindful exercise, getting more in touch with the emotions behind it. That students can come in through the dietitians, um, and that they can come in through the counseling center. Um, we offer at the counseling center um, formal eating disorder assessments um, that are one-on-one um, -on -one with the therapist, as well as using some norms, psychological testing, um, to really look at how does this individual you know, compare um, behaviorally with other individuals who identify as having eating disorders. Um, we run eating disorder body image groups um, and offer individual counseling. We um, really like to say that everybody starts at the counseling center. We have a set care model and um, we're a place for every student to start kind of regardless of what's going on for them and then based on their unique circumstances, there's a wide variety of services um, that students can um, utilize both here on campus and or um, within our community um, based on what's going on for them. Um, statistically, um, we know that um, only 30% of people struggling with eating disorders ever access help. And we also know that for the age population that we have, that approximately 20% of the students walking around campus are struggling with some form of eating disorder, disordered eating. So if you run those numbers in your head, that's pretty startling. Mm -hmm. And I should mention too that we do have um, listings in the back of the gallery. Um, and we will, we can add those on, on the as well. Um, in recreation services, I know I'm here representing fitness and you think of the gym a lot, but I also just want to make sure we talk about other opportunities to be active, that it doesn't mean coming into the weight room or necessarily, you know, running. We have an outdoor rec program, so you don't even have to come to the gym. If you want to climb, you can climb. Um, if you're interested in sports, you know, we have intramurals, lots of ways to be active like that, and also sport clubs, so ways to be a part of a team in, in that team environment and in the club. Um, so there's some great opportunities there, in addition to, you know, our, our fitness classes really being, you know, I would say it's a diverse program in that we have everything from yoga and Pilates, that can be another more mindful, mind-body approach, all the way to, you know, our CrossFit-style classes, so that we can really try to serve um, all interests of whatever you really like to do. And so that's, that's really what I try to work with people on, is, like, if you really dislike yoga, then let's not do yoga. Like, let's find something that you really love to do. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's something that's great about our programs and recreation services here is we, we really strive to try to have something for everyone, whatever way that is that you like to move your body. Um, Michelle talked a lot about the, the treatment team, but you know, especially um, knowing that the, like you can come in in any, in any avenue, like she was saying. So. You know, if, if over-exercise is something that someone's really struggling with, then come start in recreation services and we'll help get you connected to the other areas. Because I think that can be overwhelming when you feel like, well, where should I go? Who can I talk to? But knowing that we're a close-knit team and we know who to refer and how to help people find some of those other connections that they really need. Um, and also knowing that we have a really uh, robust personal training program. So for even for people who have maybe never exercised and they're, they're in a different place, maybe they're struggling with some other things that they'd like to become active, we also have personal trainers that will you know, start with you from day one to just really talk to you and figure out what you like and where you might want to go and what your goals are and how we can support you. And I mentioned that you know, even with our student staff and you know, all of our trainers and all of our instructors are students themselves. Um, and the way that we, you know, the training that we go through, I mean, right now we're really focused on, like, let's talk about what kind of cues you're giving in the fitness classes as we head towards Thanksgiving. Like, what are you saying and how are you approaching that? And just making sure we're creating that supportive environment and really
really um, taking away from that focus on how you look when you're in the fitness class. And, that, and even we even have a studio where we have we don't have mirrors, so we even really try to you know take the focus away from how you look and, and all of those things while you're exercising. So um, that and then something that I wanted to share that I experienced with the, everything that happened with COVID is that when everything shut down and we all went home, fitness included went online. Like everything became online. And in myself, I noticed the struggles that I was having in some of the fitness things that I was participating in online. Because now all of a sudden, these celebrity trainers are doing free fitness classes. So now I start questioning my own body image, which is something that, you know, I felt like I had come to a place where I was something other than I was comfortable. And so talking about the model and how you're, you know, you're in that continuum and you can bounce back and forth. And so one thing we did in recreation services that I felt was really important was we got our instructors online on Instagram teaching classes. So it was back to seeing your peers, seeing people from all different bodies and backgrounds. So we could kind of diffuse that whole, it's all the celebrity trainers that are out there on Instagram. So um, we have a great program that, that starting November 16th, we're doing Fitness on Demand, where we're going to release our actual fitness instructors teaching fitness classes so that the Iowa State community can have real people that are here on campus and not, you know, all of the <laughs> celebrity fitness stuff that we see online. So mm -hmm. that's another service that we're having here in November. Cool. Yeah, cool. yeah, our own exercise with me. <laughs> well, I do a fair bit of guest lecturing with dietetic students. So each new class, I always bring up the conversation about the pressures of being a dietitian to look a certain way, eat a certain way. And even with classmates, classmates are always looking at each other, oh, you're Sort of thing. So have very open, honest conversations and what messages are they receiving in their schooling about um, that would you know perpetuate diet culture and weight stigma. And it just has been fascinating the responses I've been getting from people. And so from those different conversations that I have, I'm like the go-to person. I'll even get an email that says, my roommate heard you talk in one of her classes and she, sh she said I should contact you. And so then I get them set up, you know, I'll you know, give them the resources to go to student counseling and that sort of thing. And then uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion is, I mean, it's an enterprise-wide office, so think like IT, you know, like we're supposed to be taking care of the whole community. And so we can, the three ways that we impact campus is that we do consultations, we collaborate, and we engage people. And so when groups like, or when people like Michelle are thinking, this policy is really horrible, you know, for body image harmony. That we're an office that can that we can work together to maybe impact some of the policy changes on campus, or the way that we decided. Well, we can talk to facilities about how are we just making these decisions about classrooms, and maybe you need an expert as a part of it. So our office sometimes can insert ourselves into things because we're expected to do that. We're expected to go and say what's happening here is not good for everybody. You know, so let's talk about how we can be more inclusive there. So that's kind of a, one of the fun parts of my job. <laughs> <laughs> well, and um, is the exercise clinic still happening for like community and faculty and staff over in kinesiology? I don't, I don't know. know. I used to do it. Um, so that's a, that's a non-student. I mean, it's a it's a, a service for faculty and staff. Uh, faculty can do. I don't know if it's called that. Yeah. Yep. But the exercise clinic through the kinesiology department, Warren Frankie used to do it. Mm -hmm. Really low cost. You get this great setup. Well, it's a setup in the gymnasium and you can work out and all that. And it's very low stress. And they also have kinesiology students that um, that can be personal trainers for folks too. So if you're concerned about going into a gym setting, mm -hmm. um, that's another service on campus. But I don't know if it still exists. I just loved it. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was there pre-COVID. I just don't know the COVID answer. But yeah. right up until then, yes. So I, I assume in some capacity. Yeah. I just don't know. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate your time and sharing your thoughts. And um, I will, if you, either of you have questions, I'm sure our panel will be happy to take them. Um, but I do invite you to walk around, um, read the interpretations, and we'll hang out and uh, answer questions you have. So thank you. Thank you.